Hello and welcome to Searching for the Question Live. My name is David Orban, and I am very glad that you are following the show. We are streaming simultaneously on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and uh, you can comment uh, and ask questions. That is the beauty of being live. Also, you can subscribe to the channel on uh, YouTube in order to be alerted uh, when uh, future episodes are uh, listed and then alerted as well when I am live together with my guest. We also have a Discord community, and uh, I invite you to join on davidorban.com slash Discord, uh, where we are continuing the conversation around the themes of the various episodes, uh, as well as many other things that uh, the community comes up with. Uh, and of course, uh, if you find uh, what uh, I do valuable uh, and uh, want to support me as well as my team in uh, the production of the content and uh, other material that we uh, create, you can become a supporter on Patreon at patreon.com slash David Orban. Today, we are going to talk about how to dominate the onslaught of information that uh, each of us is subject to. Well, if not dominate, how to at least attempt to be on top of the increasing amount of information that we are receiving. Because undoubtedly, uh, it is a challenge. And we are going to do it uh, with a specific angle. And there can be, of course, many other approaches. And hopefully in other episodes, we will look at other approaches as well. But the way that we are going to look at it today is through uh, the analysis of text. And this text can be of many different types, many different sources. And we are going to uh, be doing it uh, together with uh, our guest uh, today, who is Dmitry Paranyushkin. And uh, welcome, Dmitry, on Searching for Thank the Question Live. So uh, what we do typically uh, is, is to start and, and talk about the person rather than the topic or a product or a service. And I am curious, um, you were born in, in Russia. Uh, you live in Paris. Today, you are talking to us from Berlin. I don't know how you achieved going there. Maybe you are there since the past three, four months, um, or or you have some very strange underground uh, method of uh, traveling uh, under the pandemic. So tell us a little bit about uh, your your uh, history and and how you got where you are. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I, I really enjoy watching you. So to tell a few words about myself, um, I think I was always curious in uh, learning new things. Um, and that has been like a driving force for me. And that's what brought me to all the things that I'm working on, all the interests I have. And uh, I studied economics and maths in Moscow, in Moscow State University. And then I went on to completely change uh, my occupation and became involved into contemporary theater, performance, dance, and music. And um, I kind of tried to combine both. Um, it didn't work so well. So then I shifted completely to making art. And then I came back to programming, working on digital tools. And gradually, actually, through dance, I got inspired uh, in this idea of uh, finding connections and uh, making these connections visible, understanding them. Because I was working with a dance teacher who had a very inspiring approach to the body, working through the relationships in the body. So that made me think about neural networks, about networks. I started to study them. I had some background from the school. And then I started developing um, scientific works um, in that subject, network analysis, text network analysis, especially. Then I built a tool that is called This is Like, where you could type something in and see what is like that. Um, and then I kind of went very granular into this associative network uh, way of thinking. So then I got to words because uh, 
it started with places, you know, which place in Paris is like that other place that I know in Berlin, for example. And then I thought, okay, you can also use it for philosophers or for writers, but also for, for, for the concepts and for language, for, for words. And then gradually I went too deep uh, for that particular project to be successful, uh, but it made me learn a lot about how networks work. And then I developed the tool that I'm working on now called uh, Infranodos Text Network Analysis Tool. And uh, and uh, absolutely, that is uh, fascinating. Um, uh, and uh, what attracted you to to France and 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 Paris? You know, surprisingly, it was one of the most exotic places that I could think of because um, I'm from Russia. I've been to India, for example, Indonesia, and um, I kind of um, knew what to expect a little bit everywhere. But in Paris and France, uh, it kind of looked very unpredictable. And I also met really nice people there, really nice friends, uh, and the people that I'm working with now, and it kind of made me be very interested to settle down there for a longer time. Wonderful. I, I love uh, uh, Paris as well, and uh, it, is, it is certainly a, a, fantastic, a fantastic city. Um, when you studied uh, programming and, and networks, um, did you, what, what kind of abstraction layer did you reach in terms of of looking at the nature of networks did you study it from a mathematical point of view first or did you go right away into into programming uh, and and the reason i'm asking the question is because i have this uh, wonderful book in my hand i don't know if you are familiar with it and um and uh, I also have uh, um, a, a, an interview with uh, Albert Laszlo Borobashi, uh, whose name is uh, even more difficult than yours. Uh, he, he is Hungarian, uh, as I am. And uh, I met him in New York uh, some time ago. Uh, and um, and we, had a, we, de we had a great uh, conversation. Uh, I can... Uh, share the url of this uh, uh, video in the in the show notes afterwards but uh, the approach that uh, that barbashi has f of uh, towards networks is is very formal right and and very scientific scientifically sound so that is that is uh, the the source of my question towards you. Did you come to to the the concept of networks from an academic and scientific uh, perspective, or or were you first rather interested in in uh, the applications uh, in, and and then maybe tried to understand them more deeply? Right. Well, I had a very good teacher when I was in Moscow, actually maybe one of the few teachers that I really liked and uh, he was teaching graph science, in fact. So it was like a course in com combinatorics, but he chose to make it just about graphs exclusively. And uh, then he's, he was also talking about all this stuff like Fibonacci numbers, all these mathematical wonders, uh, which I was anyway interested in. Um, um, you mentioned uh, this book of Barabasi. One book that really inspired me uh, was a book which talked about mathematics and nature. So how things can be described in nature using very simple formulas from the way the trees look to the way the landscapes are built. Unfortunately, I don't remember the name, but um, I was always interested in graph theory because I saw that it was a reflection of how a lot of things are organized uh, in everyday life. So. The beginning of the interest was academic and scientific, but then I kind of left it behind. And then uh, when I got into dance, like I told you, it was a very surprising comeback for me because the teacher that I was working with, uh, his way of practicing dance was like practicing network inside the body. You were thinking in terms of relations and moving these relations and then doing that over and over again. 
made me very inspired to also think about networks. It's like I was uh, sort of, if you can be brainwashed through the body, I don't know, but uh, I got really into networks again. And then I started wondering uh, what exists out there on the subject. And then I got into neural networks. Uh, but I would say it's always been a mix of academic approach and then intuition and the intuition which was uh, embodied. So this is also one very important aspect of my work is that I try to uh, channel all the concepts I'm working on through the body to understand them better, to have uh, some kind of um, reflexes, uh, not only thoughts, but also reflexes about how things work. So it's always been this reciprocal relationship between science and uh, some kind of embodied intuitive understanding. Um, a, a great book that talks about uh, the mathematical relationships between natural uh, systems and, and abstract networks uh, is uh, A New Kind of Science by uh, Stephen Wolfram. And Stephen was a guest uh, a few uh, weeks ago uh, on the show concerning his new uh, theory or the extension of of uh, his work uh, from 20 years ago that uh, he published in this book. At the time, this book was was really, uh, uh, I don't know, like $100, you know, one of those huge uh, paper books, and now is all available, nicely indexed uh, uh, online. So it is, it is really uh, great to consult it like this. Uh, but there are, of course, many others, exactly because uh, the the uh, the nature of natural ph phenomena is both wonderfully described by mathematics and networks, as well as we believe that uh, these phenomena are the embodiment of those models. And uh, of course, from a philosophical point of view, we still don't have a good answer of why this is the case. Why is it even possible? for mathematics to be so incredibly powerful and, and, and why does nature choose to follow mathematical models? But uh, it is, it is definitely looks like it is the case. So, so that is, that is very, very, very surprising. So um, you, you, you say that uh, uh, the, the embodiment in your case is even closer and stronger because a lot of your work comes from inspiration through dance, through theater, through relationships between people. So um, th this is even, even uh, more appropriate and, and, and more closely related uh, for you. Right, yeah, of course. Uh... There is always uh, this moment when you need to get the tools and uh, to use them to understand something better. But I think that uh, most of the time, the main impulse was through the practice, which I didn't expect would lead me to networks. And then, of course, uh, once I started get busy with it, uh, then it really helped uh, that I knew how to program because uh, I had an idea and then I thought, okay, I'm just going to make it happen and I tried something out. Like I told you this website that was uh, uh, letting people share their associative networks of thought. And then, like I said, I got so excited about it that instead of focusing it on only one aspect, let's say only travel or only music or something like this, I thought, oh, wow, it can be about everything. So I got overexcited and then I went very granular on connecting different concepts together. So I think when someone came to that website, they were slightly confused because they would see that you can find similar clubs, let's say, or music, but you can also talk about post-structuralism and uh, see how Derrida relates to Foucault and how the notion of post-structuralism relates to postmodernism, for example. So then it got a little bit lost uh, how it also can happen with uh, rhizomatic thinking. Uh, but then I decided that the level of language, this layer of language, uh, was something granular enough for me to have a feeling that I'm dealing with the core and with the essence of uh, this approach. And then also because you can actually translate anything into language. Like recently with my friend Kudes, uh, who is a, a techno artist, he, he actually called me up and he said, look, they sequenced... Uh, 
uh, coronavirus, uh, and there is uh, an article in New York Times where there are sequences um, of it, like uh, uh, letters, you know, all the codons. And we had a, for a long time this idea that we want to translate DNA code into music. So then he called me up and he said, oh, look, we should put this into Infernotus, it's text, and see what kind of graphs come up. You know, so then, of course, you can then process any data, uh, genetic code, uh, text, uh, your own, uh, like, music even. For instance, we also did experiments with music where you play notes through MIDI, and then you can visualize the structure of your musical score, and then you can play it back in a nonlinear way. So, in fact, this layer, which uh, I'm operating at now, allows me to go as much meta or uh, as much... Uh, zooming in as uh, as uh, I want. So shortly we will start talking about specifics uh, and, and you hinted at uh, many possible applications already. But uh, yeah, let's answer a question from Emiliano. What kind of computers were available in Russia in the 80s? Uh, I don't know why Russia is in quotes. In, that was the Soviet Union at the time. And and I don't know how old you are, Dimitri. So I maybe you were not even born in the eighties, but uh, certainly it it was the case that for some time, at least, not only the mathematical preparedness of Russian programmers was precious, but the fact that they grew up in fairly constrained environments where every bit was precious and their programming skills were so tight, they would be able to exploit every possible resource rather than splurge and waste resources like lazy and fat Western programmers would do, right? So um, uh, Emiliano in the meantime says, well, it's in quotes because it was the CCCP or uh, SSSR. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so, so what what kind of computers did you start with? Right. So, um, I actually started with computers. I think when I was uh, about I don't know six or seven years old. It was uh, 1987, and uh, I had a friend that I met outside uh, of my house on the street, and his father was a programmer. So he brought us to his office and he showed us the computers, and uh, I think he showed us some games. And I was kind of like, oh, wow, that's interesting. So then I came back home and told my father about it. And my father, who was a nuclear scientist uh, at the time, uh, he was also working with computers. So then he saw I was interested in it, and he started teaching me programming, in fact. Uh, and the computers that we had at that time, I think we started these regular lessons when I was maybe 10 or 11. So that was like 91 or 92. It was actually the same computers as you had in the West, you know, because... Uh, scientific institutions and uh, corporate private offices, they basically had the same stuff. And uh, also because uh, when uh, USSR was over, uh, there were a lot of people who went into business and into trading. So one of the first things that were brought to Russia were actually computers. So there was never lack of new technology um, there. And it wasn't like we were programming on some old stuff. Although I think you're right that within organizations, of course, you wouldn't be able to have resources to have supercomputers. So uh, on this kind of like high level, I guess you're right that people had to be very inventive uh, with stuff. But on the level of personal user, if you had access to this kind of technology, because, uh, for example, for me, my father was involved uh, in science, just like it was actually in the West, or if you had enough money, but it was not so much of a money issue actually at that time, you would be able to have access to the same stuff. And uh, basically that's how we started, you know, on this big monitors, basic Pascal, uh, playing around with some stuff. I remember those floppy disks. Uh, and then there was this evolution happening. And then the internet, uh, I think I first encountered it in 1994 or 1995 and actually started ordering books on Amazon. And that was re really interesting for me because I never imagined that you can order something from the US, like a book in English, and have it arrive to Russia because there was nothing in Russia at the time. You know, like you even didn't have chewing gums, I think, yet, but you could order 
things from Amazon. And uh, this I find very impressive. So Amazon has a special place in my heart. And when people hate on it, uh, I have to <laughs> remind them that for some people, they were the only channel to get knowledge. Like if it was not for Amazon, I would not read all those books on computers, on psychology, on science. Uh, that book that, that, that I mentioned about nature and mathematics, it was also from Amazon. So yeah, I mean, we had all the same stuff, but sometimes we had to work a little bit harder for it, I would say. Wonderful. So let's uh, let's uh, uh, talk about your your product right uh, at least the current one and then your next passion is going to be who knows what but today you are in love with this network analysis and um, as uh, smart people do uh, rather than just looking at what is available you said okay i'm going to do my own thing because then i can do it exactly the way I like it. Uh, so let's uh, share your screen and start talking about uh, Infranodus, which anybody can start uh, using on infranodus.com. Uh, uh, and I really recommend you do because you can sign up for free and start playing around with a lot of very, very cool stuff. So why don't we start with some of the standard examples that people can find as they log in uh, because the system prods you to, to, to test um, examples from right. public sources. And, and then, and then we, we start from there and then we will look at, look at other things. Okay. So I'm going to show you actually what got me excited first about the tool. Uh, it's this ability to... Uh, be able to write and to visualize. So, for example, see, I'm typing things in, and uh, the words that I'm typing, they appear. Uh, and then I add more sentences, then um, I keep on constructing my thoughts. So, for me, this was uh, the kind of uh, most exciting part about the tool is that I could see in real time uh, how my thought is getting this would be a kind of mind mapping really right what what others yeah. call mind mapping right so it's it's a bit different from mind mapping because uh, in mind maps uh, what i normally see is that people like to organize their thoughts in tree like hierarchical structures it's not always the case but most of the time you have a central concept and then you have to be making connections yourself uh, so you link one concept to another here it's the language uh, which is being visualized so basically every word is a node so for example show uh, david is a node and then if the words appear together in the same context they're connected with a connection and this is the algorithm this is how it works but uh, when you apply it to any text, you get really interesting, complex structures that come up. And then uh, the advantage is that you can use graph theory and network science to then uh, calculate what is the community structure of your te text graph, what are the most influential nodes, how they're related. So I'm going to show you now one interesting use case where we take it to the next level. So for example, I think here, yeah, it's a visualization of the tweets from today. So Infranodus has a, has a few apps which, which you can use uh, to import all kinds of data from Twitter and your Evernote notes to uh, news feeds, uh, web pages. You can also write your own text, uh, upload PDF documents, CSV files, and so on. In this case, it's the visualization of the tweets for today. So as you can see, um, I think it has around 200 tweets that were selected uh, as the most popular ones by Twitter themselves and you can quickly see on the graph how the concepts are connected uh, which words uh, were used in the same context so for example here we have a analytics panel and we can see that the four main topical groups um, is the conversations about defunding police uh, something about barack obama and corruption maybe some new twitter storm um, another topic about uh, human and love uh, and then American giving choice. 
And then you also see the most influential elements. So these are the nodes that have the highest between the centrality. And uh, that's the beauty of being able to visualize any text as a graph, because then you can get access to all those really interesting tools from graph science, which enable you to see what are the most influential elements, what are the main topics. So there is actually more of them here and here, how they're all connected. Um, and the most influential elements, it's not necessarily the most frequently mentioned terms. You can make a setting inside Infranodus that is going to be most frequently mentioned terms, but by default, we use uh, between a centrality, which calculates how often a node appears uh, on the shortest path between any two random nodes in the network. And what it means is that basically which nodes uh, function as the junctions of meaning. So which words are connecting the most um, amount of different topics together. And this is how the influence comes up here. You know, So you see that a lot of the things on Twitter are still about uh, Black Lives Matter, police, America, and so on. By the way, if you were to look uh, into visualization of tweets uh, when coronavirus was raining, it was all about coronavirus. And ironically, also, if you look at the visualization of news for today, you, st you see it's still a lot about coronavirus. So they're not talking so much about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, they mostly focus on coronavirus, life coverage, uh, how many people are infected, how many people died, uh, the market, and uh, Trump, and so on. So this is it in a nutshell. It kind of gives you an overview. But then another really interesting topic, uh, if you want, I can talk about it, is how to generate insight from this data. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that uh, in being able to visualize uh, is the the first step in understanding relationships, but to gain insight that is actionable is even more valuable. So, so yes, let's definitely look at that. Right. So, for example, if we take the tweets uh, that we looked at before, usually how I like to work with the graph is to get an overview at first, just to know what it's about, to verify some of the hypotheses I have. And then um, I click on the inside panel and here it identifies what's called structural gap. And this concept of a structural gap, it comes from uh, social sciences. And what it does is that it identifies uh, which two communities inside this network uh, could be connected but are not very well linked yet. And uh, in the social sciences, this means that there is a certain distance between two groups of people. Let's say uh, if it was your social network, then this orange part could be your professional uh, group. Let's say all the people that you took interviews uh, from. And this would be some people you worked with when you worked on a certain project together. So what it's proposing you is that, look, you have these two groups which are not very well connected, so it might be interesting to make a link between them. And in the social sciences, this is usually where the, the new opportunities and the potential for new uh, innovative uh, movements come. And so what I did was to translate this theory into how we can analyze text networks and basically applied the same approach. And of course it exists, I think it's called structural holes or there is also this idea of knowledge gaps and so on. So it has many different names, but the idea is just to look at the whole structure to see what are the gaps inside and then to propose questions that would enable you to bridge those gaps. Because once you start answering the question, so for example, here it says uh, that there is a gap between uh, this topic here and this topic here. And uh, once you also click on reveal the gap, you actually see two statements which could be linked together. So when you ask this question, it would enable you to generate an, an idea which would seem uh, not so obvious, but maybe highly relevant because it's connecting two very important topics together. And this would be one of the ways to generate insight using the tool. Um, one of the reasons why I got uh, uh, into actually searching for stuff and then finding uh, uh, Infranodus uh, is because I, uh, as well, generate uh, a lot of uh, content. And uh, 
Um, as a matter of fact, uh, searching for the question live is just one series. And another series of uh, uh, videos that I produce uh, uh, weekly is uh, called uh, The Context. And um, uh, The Context is now, has been going for two years every week. Uh, so it has a lot of episodes. And uh, for me, it is a little bit of a concern of not uh, excessively repeating myself. I, I understand that uh, in some way it is not only unavoidable, but even desirable to link different episodes together and to go back certain concepts that could benefit from repetition so that the viewers uh, can, can understand it in different light. But still, I, I wanted to avoid of, of, of being um, uh, excessively repeating myself. So that is why I, I went and wanted to have something more than classical word clouds, uh, which are pretty um, primitive tools for representing uh, uh, the concepts uh, in, a, in a given volume of text. I wanted more like a topic extraction tool. And it was funny because um, somebody whom uh, I've known for many, many years has a very successful company uh, and they do a lot of things all text oriented. They are quoted on NASDAQ and, and whatever else. And it looked like one of the tools they have could be useful for me. So I, I reached out to my friend and he referred me to the department managing that tool and they, they um, had me test it and it looked like it wasn't perfectly adapted to my needs, but using the API, maybe I could use it. And then I asked, okay, wonderful. So I tested it, but if I really wanted to use it, how would it work? And they were saying, well, uh, really the minimum uh, yearly license uh, is uh, around $50,000 and then uh, we would personalize it for you so our typical clients uh, end up paying between hundred and hundred and fifty thousand dollars and then we can start talking so I said thank you very much wonderful and and great job really not for me and then uh, you know just uh, the power of uh, online search I found uh, 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 Infranodus, and I really started to use it, as you say. This is, for example, the uh, topic network of uh, the latest episode of, uh, of the context. And I like uh, using one of the other uh, features, uh, playing uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the video uh, of... Uh, or, or, or the movie, rather, not the video, playing the movie uh, of, um, uh, of uh, how the, the network develops. And I am not uh, too familiar with the interface, so I, I cannot trigger exactly what I mean, but it is nice to see. Uh, and I am planning to play, keep playing around uh, already, uh, for example, in, in my newsletters, um, I... Um, attach the topic graph uh, when I send out uh, the newsletter talking about the video and what I am mentioning. And so I, I want to keep playing. Uh, uh, the next one I want to do is rather than uh, just a snapshot of the graph, I want to embed into the newsletter a GIF uh, so that it plays as people open the newsletter and they already see it blossoming. So I, I am having a lot of fun uh, with the tool. Let's let's go back, uh, Dimitri, uh, to your screen and uh, look at some some other examples that uh, that you can show. Uh, um, oh, there you go. That is what I wasn't able for some reason to to do uh, as it uh, as it builds. Uh, um, uh, or 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 some other sources uh, that uh, can uh, okay that is that is how it is building up right so 
I mean, first of all, you're right that uh, graphs uh, are generally much more interesting than tech clouds because the advantage here is that you see terms and contexts. If you look at the tech cloud, it only shows you what the most important words are, but it doesn't show you the relations between them. Surprisingly, still, I mean, it's very hard to find tech clouds which would even position the words next to each other. So you see, let's say, coronavirus, so you see police, but you don't know what it's about, what it's related to. On the graphs, you solve this problem because uh, the words are aligned based on their co-occurrence, and you get both qualitative and quantitative uh, data on that co-alignment, which means you can visualize it, but you can also use graph theory to calculate uh, which words belong to the same topic, how they're related, and so on. So this is one great advantage. Another point you mentioned about the existence of tools out there which cost uh, tens of th th thousands of dollars. I mean, I'm having these conversations, I think, several times a week with my users because uh, it's just not fair, you know? There is either really complicated uh, scientific tools which are impossible to use or you need to have experience with Python and with programming languages or on the other side you have companies like Quid uh, where if you want a demo you have to write many different emails and maybe then they give you access and then actually if you want to use it it's just prohibitively high the cost so for me one of my tasks is to democratize uh, this approach to knowledge and to make these tools available to everyone this is why we have a uh, open source version and there is also the enterprise cloud version so you can basically get a lot of different options and it's priced uh, in a very democratic how we say in russia <laughs> way well, so well, available I, to everyone it it is it is really astonishing because it is either free or if you really want to pay you pay nine dollars a month, I think, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm I'm very happy to be paying that because the tool is really valuable, and I hope uh, thousands of people are equally happy, and then I don't know millions, um, because um, it is really uh, really great, and and also going open source is is so important. Uh, uh, Microsoft. Uh, was violently against uh, open source, uh, even labeling it uh, the cancer of the software industry until uh, this year, uh, they finally admitted that it was one of their biggest blunders uh, to not realize the power and the importance of, of open source. Uh, so uh, open source uh, tools are, are, are definitely the future. And if someone wants to be part of the future, they need to be open source. Uh, that that is also true equally. Uh, so, just I wanted to show this is the newsletter that went out uh, this uh, Sunday, and there is the embedded uh, uh, Infranodus uh, network uh, graph uh, on the same uh, on the text of the of the video. And that's because, great. Yeah, we are. Uh, we are um, uh, uh, transcribing uh, uh, the video uh, in, in real time and then uh, making uh, the transcription available and then the network graph available. And, and, and this is, for me, really important because um, on one hand, we need to um, make as much information available as possible. A lot of knowledge and a lot of insight is valuable. But it is also paradoxical because this abundance of uh, information is, is um, unavoidably threatening. Uh, the, the degree of attention that any of, of us can uh, dedicate uh, must be balanced with uh, the uh, 24 hours we have available. And, and that is why these tools are so vitally uh, important. Um, so what are uh, your perspectives? What is uh, your goal uh, as you uh, keep uh, working on, on Infranodus? What are some of the forthcoming features or integrations uh, that, uh, that, you are, uh, that you are working on today? Right. It's a very good 
Good question, David. So for me, what's very important uh, is that um, I think the world is moving towards uh, something where uh, there will be a lot of moments that uh, some truths will attempt to take over the rest of the landscape. This is happening a lot when you look at how news proliferate today through social media. This is happening a lot uh, with uh, ideologies and so on. So there is this tendency of things to become totalitarian. And for me, uh, the only thing that we can do to resist that and to not allow this to happen, because uh, we understand that if we allow this to happen, then uh, we get into a very unstable situation and it might also be dangerous. It's nice to get uh, overwhelmed by one idea for a certain period of time, but then it's nice to also shift and to change uh, what you uh, are working on or what you give focus to, or maybe what's getting resources and so on. So for me, the main notion is the notion of diversity. And uh, if we talk about people in the context of diversity, it's the notion of what Elon Musk recently called in his Joe Rogan podcast, mind viral immunity. But basically it's the ability to uh, choose what information comes in, how much it enters into your system, how much it propels you to act, and uh, also how much you are able to choose uh, which, which truth you support. And that when you see that one truth is trying to overtake the rest, that at least you're able to see that and to do something about it, if you want. Of course, you might be uh, fine with it as well. But I think it's important to give people tools that would enable them to uh, see the informational landscape and all its diversity and to promote this kind of ecological uh, way of distributing our attention to things. This is on one side. On the other side, uh, with the development of AI and uh, different technologies and with the impeding si singularity point, we know that there will be a lot of algorithms. They already are in charge of things, but there will be a lot of algorithms that will be in charge of a lot of different things. And if you read uh, most of the books and materials and artificial intelligence today, uh, they talk about uh, value functions, they talk about uh, rational choices and so on. But I think that uh, it's a very natural human thing to be irrational and not to also know exactly why you're doing something and to be creative in that way also because not everything can be measured uh, in terms of monetary value. And sometimes when you make the link between what you do and the value it brings, you might be only looking at money or, or a good feeling, but maybe you're not taking account of other stuff. So basically, you know, we get to the point that uh, the technology today is developed based on a very rational principle, all, almost like, like as if there is only one truth. And so what I want to do is to uh, propose the kind of algorithms which would enable machines to practice this more ecological and uh, diverse way of thinking. So for humans on the one side and for the machines on the other through APIs and all the different tools. And so this is kind of like the general picture. And more specifically within Fronodos, uh, what I've been doing in the last months is that I'm talking to my users, including you, and we had a great conversation where you and your colleague, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Massimo Curatella. Massimo, exactly. Like you had very good ideas of how how I could improve the interface. So at the moment I'm working on uh, on doing that, you know, talk, talking to my users, asking them how they use the tool, uh, what they already like, what could be better, and together with them making it something very useful and uh, streamlined. So this is kind of like one aspect of usability. And then another aspect is of course, the aspect of uh, resilience because uh, as the tool and the user base is growing, there are some challenges uh, with the performance uh, that you need to address if you want things to continue developing in that way. So this is another aspect of work is to make it more resilient. And of course, uh, working on developing the API to make it available to other services. Um, I, I like it very much how you express the, the human need uh, building uh, our memetic immune system uh, in the growing digital sphere uh, where our biological immune system has evolved uh, uh, through 
millions uh, of years, uh, as a matter of fact, billions of years, uh, but uh, uh, our ability to preserve um, a coherent identity uh, in uh, the world of ideas is much more recent. And uh, uh, our uh, uh, the, the degree at which we can be influenced uh, and uh, without even realizing adopt the points of view of others that can be advantageous to us or not uh, is uh, something that we haven't fully understood yet. And uh, we need to strengthen and we need to, to make more uh, reliable, more powerful, and available to, to, to everybody. And then you expressed uh, that from the point of view of the machines, tools like yours uh, could enable them to develop uh, a, a better insight and better empathy uh, towards human needs that uh, uh, may not be otherwise taken into consideration by algorithms that are excessively utilitarian and that uh, are not representing correctly the rich set of human drives and human desires. Wonderful. Looking forward to uh, these uh, to be, on one hand, implemented in future versions of Infranodus, but also articulated uh, as, as, uh, as an important component of, of your thought leadership in, in maybe conferences or, or in other ways. Um, so, what what uh, clusters of users uh, did you find and and was there any that you didn't expect and was surprising for you as uh, infranodus is being adopted uh, in in various places yeah so most of the users are actually researchers that uh, work in universities that work in text analysis comparative literature uh, who are doing studies of sentiment online, offline, and so on. So it's researchers who are interested uh, in people and uh, in texts. There is also another cohort of users uh, who work in marketing, search engine optimization, because you have uh, really good applications of Infranodos where you can basically see the graph of what people uh, search for and what they actually find, and then look at the difference and see that uh, there are certain terms that people look for, but they don't find any information on them. So this is your gap where you could target uh, to reach your audience. And then uh, there is, uh, I think, another group which for me was very surprising is actually people who just use it for fun, just like me. I never thought that uh, people would use all these features like playing the graph or connecting it to the music devices because there is a feature inside Infranodus that you can actually play the graph. And uh, I thought, okay, this, this I'm just doing for myself and for my friends, you know, and no one will use it. But I'm always surprised to hear that actually lots of users, they tell me, oh, like, you know, I actually made a video recording of the graph and I just use it for the presentations just to show my students, for instance, uh, how, how a graph can evolve or like you said, to make a GIF out of it. It's not a feature that was really obvious to me somehow that it would be interesting for people. But of course, because graphs look great and it allows you in a very efficient way communicate a lot of information. So this is another group of users, those who just use it to play around and for fun. And this one was the most surprising one. And I'm really happy that they exist also. Um, the input of Infranodus is natural language. And uh, currently, the output of Infranodus is an abstract mathematical structure that is visualized through the graph itself. Do you think that there could be value in Infranodus actually generating natural language, uh, going towards the direction of text summarization or other applications like that? Yeah, this is something that is in the plans. And uh, right now, by the way, already you can generate uh, tables of the relations between the terms. So it's somehow halfway between mathematical abstract structures and graphs. 
because you can take out all the topics, uh, all the correlations of words, um, all the most influential terms. For example, you can expert and filter statements that contain certain combination of terms. So you can actually get back text from Infranotus as well in a processed way with some tags next to it. But definitely what you're talking about is very interesting to also use the graphs to generate text and to generate language. And uh, um, this is something that um, I want to work on in the future once I sort out the most immediate stuff because it's a very interesting topic with all these developments uh, of the last year of OpenAI, for example. You know, I think using the graphs to even train neural networks can be an interesting approach, you know, to kind of uh, take this feedback and uh, let's say to analyze different styles of texts, not only based on the vocabulary which they use, but also on the graph structure. And yeah. then generating text, which would take into account the actual graph structure. And uh, I'm sure that it would produce very different results than uh, if you didn't take this into account. Wonderful. So Dimitri, congratulations for uh, the progress that you have made. I'm a happy user and uh, uh, thanks for uh, joining us today uh, to talk about not only the tool but your personal journey as well as uh, your ambitions in uh, uh, creating tools uh, that help humans and help machines live together in the future thank you david for for the invitation and for the opportunity it was a pleasure to be here wonderful so um I uh, want to uh, thank uh, all of you for uh, following us and for the questions and comments. Uh, and uh, uh, these are uh, really interesting uh, uh, starting points because, of course, uh, the topic is uh, so large and so important. We also touched upon uh, other um, starting points, really, of, of exploration, like uh, the uh, importance of uh, memetic uh, immunity uh, and uh, building an immune system for our uh, our minds, um, and and there will be certainly uh, uh, important uh, future conversations to be had around uh, these topics as well. Um, you can actually uh, suggest guests that uh, you believe I should uh, uh, bring on the show uh, and vote on the suggestions of others uh, going on the um, uh, address that I am now displaying. And uh, I am sure that uh, you will suggest uh, uh, interesting people. Uh, I also have a, an Italian YouTube channel, uh, if you speak the language, and uh, you can go to davidorban.com slash YouTube Italiano. Uh, in order to subscribe. And uh, as uh, at the beginning, uh, I invite you to become a, a, a supporter uh, on uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash David Orban to help me and my team produce uh, the show in the future as well. Thank you and uh, see you uh, at the next episode.